So this morning, I'm going to read the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John. Something will happen. Good. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you, Lord. And we are also just reading the opening of Genesis, the very first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Wow. I've heard of messy church, but now we have squeaky church. <laughs> Sticky church. Excellent news. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Good, morning. good to see you. I have to wear these to look at, I'm afraid. So, Mark has asked me to do uh, an introduction to John's Gospel. Thank you, Mark. It's a small task. <laughs> and uh, I want to look at, very briefly then at the, the purpose of, uh, of the book, of John's writing. And he writes, you know, what we've just, uh, what Mark referred to at the beginning. These are written, this is written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing you may have light or life in his name. So that's the purpose. Just checking that that's behind me. It is. Wonderful news. It's oh, it's there as well. Yeah, I was just checking. I'm paranoid. Am I wonder how you've seen the same thing? <laughs> so that's the purpose of the, bu the book. It's, it's in order that we might believe, and in believing might have life in his name. The Gospels, the four Gospels, next slide, the four Gospels each focus on different things. And uh, th that's not a full definition of what they all do. But Matthew really presents Jesus as king. Starts with the uh, genealogies, in, unless I'm uh, much mistaken. And it goes through right the way back to Abraham to show that Jesus was born of this lineage and came following on from Abraham, the founder or the beginning of uh, the, the Hebrews, the, the Jewish people. Um, John's gospel, he just, oh, sorry, Mark's gospel, he just dives straight in, no messing around with genealogies, no messing around with virgin births or anything, just bang, straight there. And within a few verses, he's healing the sick, casting out demons, confronting the devil and beating him, and calling his disciples and gathering everyone together. And then it was lunch, 
And then he got up and did the same thing after lunch, late into the night, healing more people, casting up. And that's just chapter one. So, you know, Mark doesn't hang around. None of this messing. Straight in there. It's my, it's my favorite gospel, actually. If anyone were to say, where would you recommend I start uh, reading scripture? I'd say, like, Mark, get stuck in there. And uh, you will not be bored. You will get through those uh, chapters very quickly. I'm not saying the others will bore you. The genealogies can be a little bit difficult. Uh, Luke... Uh, really introduces Jesus as the kingdom bringer. And so the first few chapters are all about um, the prophecy of Jesus coming, and the prophecy of John the Baptist first, then the birth of Jesus, and then uh, everything around that, and all the prophecies that were given about Jesus when he was dedicated in the temple at seven, seven days old. And the whole thing is sort of placing Jesus within the flow of prophecy. He's the kingdom bringer. He's the one that's doing what Isaiah and all the prophets said would happen. And that's where Jesus is placed with Luke. John dives straight in with the most controversial opening up of who Jesus is. Again, no messing around, no building up towards the point where you think, well, is Jesus God then? He's just straight in there. And he really um, takes, the the reason I asked for uh, Genesis 1, verses 1 to 3 to to be read, is that he starts in the same way. So Genesis, in the the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth, and then God spoke, God said, and his word produced life and light. John really picks that up and really runs with it. And he says this, uh, next slide probably, Um, straight in there, the word was with God, okay, fair enough, Um, maybe alongside, the word was God, okay, that's interesting, Um, and the word was there at the very beginning. So John just lays it out there, first first sentence of of his book. When we're talking about Jesus, did you notice Jesus by name wasn't mentioned in any of the verses we read? He's mentioned, I think, in verse 18, if I'm not mistaken, or 19. Um, And so John is laying something out here. There's this person, there's this being who is a person who was with God at the beginning. He was right alongside God. He was creating everything with God, and through him everything was made. In fact, he was God. It's out there. I have a Jewish friend, I have a number of Jewish friends, and some Palestinian friends, just to put the record straight. But this Jewish friend is also an academic, very much so. And he says to me, Steve, the thing is, if, if we didn't have John, and we didn't have Revelation, and possibly one or two verses in Hebrews, it would be possible to read the whole Bible and not come to the conclusion that Jesus is God. Messiah, yes, but Messiah doesn't mean God. Uh, Messiah means king. Um, Lord, yes, but, um, you know, given that position of lordship by God, uh, but that doesn't mean God necessarily. He said, but you can't read John and Revelation without coming to the clear conclusion that Jesus is God. It sets us apart from all the other sects I have to say that one carefully, and religions and breakaway groups that either came separate to Christianity or before Christianity, like Hinduism, or after Christianity, breaking away from it, like Islam. Um, they, They all do not allow for the very concept of God taking on human form. God being flesh. But John just puts it right out there. When we're talking about who is revealed at verse 17, as I say, is Jesus, we're talking about God's word becoming flesh, God himself being that person that we call the word. And he was there at the beginning, before there was any creation. Well, obviously he would be, because he was God. Next slide. Jesus and creation, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. Think about that. All things Every single thing that was made was made through Jesus. Without him, nothing was made. I think it's Paul who says, everything was made by him and for him. 
Not only was it made by him and released out there, as if, well, I've done my bit, I've created it, but he created it, and he created it for him. He is the reason why there was creation, and he's still the reason why we exist. We are created, along with all of creation, for him. Incidentally, I do believe that God will redeem the whole of creation. Separate sermon, different day. Let's, let's concentrate on humans for the moment. Jesus and creation, everything was made by him and for him. Now, all I'm doing this morning is, is laying the table. In these first few verses, you, you then get what John unpacks all the way through John's gospel. So you will go into more depth on all of these things. But at the moment, I'm just spreading the table. This is what you're going to eat. <laughs> okay. um, the next slide. The true light was coming into the world. So remember Genesis, and God spoke, and uh, there was light. And he separated light from darkness. That's because that light is a reflection of the light, which is Jesus. In the new heavens and the new earth, uh, when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, and everything's put right, it's pictorial, but it's right, um, we find that there's no need for the sun or the moon, because Jesus is there and he is the light. So what we see in creation is a reflection of something much, much deeper, which is Jesus is the light. The true light was coming into the world. Again, as you go through John's gospel, um, you, you get, you'll get this more and more unpacked. There's a lot of things that John does that he simply lays out and, and then Jesus himself unpacks it through what he says, what he does, what he calls us to believe. Um, verse, uh, sorry, the next slide. All, now th this is one of those really deep ones. It's all deep. <laughs> all who receive him have the right to become children of God. So he is the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, as John says a bit later on. But we, when we receive him, he gives to us also the right to become children of God. We are born of God. And again, okay, so there is a little bit of debate about, are we born again or are we adopted? Are we born or are we adopted? Are we natural born children or are we adopted into his family? Well, the, and you'll find both of those words coming up as we go through, as you go through, John together and other parts of the Bible. But we're born of the Spirit. We're not just humans who've been adopted into his family. We're born of his Spirit. We are born of God. The spirit that brought life and light to the creation of the universe brings life and light to us, and we are born. So sometimes translated born again, better translation, born from above. We're born from above. At one level, we have nothing to do with, we do, and I love to my father, and I respected him and do vastly, but there's more to Steve than Don Bridge. And Rita Bridge, that's my mother. Bless her, she's still with us. 91 and still the boss. You're not putting this out there, are you? <laughs> but there's more to Steve than his natural lineage. And born of God, born of the Spirit. And often there's a war between what is natural in me and what God wants to form in me and you. There's a fight, there's a battle. Am I going to serve the flesh or am I going to serve the spirit? Am I going to live as one who is born from above or am I going to live as if I've not been born from above and simply born through natural means? But Jesus said, unless you're born again or born from above, you can't even see the kingdom. He said that in chapter 3, what we call chapter 3, to Nicodemus. If you're not born from above, you can't even see the kingdom. That's why people who don't know and have never met Jesus can debate endlessly about him and about the kingdom and why, there are, why some people get healed and some people don't and why this and why that and why there's suffering. Huge questions. But until we're born from above, we can't even begin to see what God is doing. You can't rationalize somebody into seeing the kingdom. It has to come from above. And to those who receive him, 
He is the life giver. He gives us the right to become children of God, born of God. Adoption is a different thing. It has to do with the position that we have, which is about authority and the right to rule, and that's a different subject. Mark will do that another day. But don't ever think that, oh, I'm just adopted, nothing's really changed. And when you get fed up with this adoption and wish he hadn't done it, <laughs> I mean, come on, I, you know. We're born from above. He is our father. He taught his disciples, when you pray, say, Abba, Father, Daddy, Dad, family name, family way of talking about fatherhood. It's what little children cry out when they see their father, if they're Jewish. Abba, Abba, Abba. And that's what the Spirit does within us. He begins to cry out, Abba, my dad. That's big. That is big. And I'll tell you a little secret. It's not a secret because I often mention it. Um, you know, when I've done something or said something or thought something, I find myself in something that I know is not right. Ooh, don't, yes, I do occasionally find myself in that position. Um, then when I become aware of having sinned, fallen short, transgressed, the temptation is to, is to drop the father bit and come back like the prodigal son saying, I'm no longer worthy to be your child. But if you want me to, I'll keep working for you. But God's not having it. We come back to him as father. Nothing's changed. Except we, we've grieved God. We've grieved the Spirit. Why have we grieved him? Because he cares. Because we're his children. And he sees his grief over what we've done in the light of Jesus, who's done everything that needed to be done in order to hold us in that relationship. Because we are born from above. God is our Father. Next slide. Jesus is introduced by John as the incarnate word, the, the word that became flesh. So think about to, to Genesis, where we read there. In the verse 3, I think it is, we read that God spoke. And through what he spoke, life came into being. What John is saying, and it's really from John, that the, the whole concept of the Trinity began to emerge. What John is saying is that word that was spoken was, was God. And that God, that bit of God, and I struggle with language here, um, that element of God became flesh. The creative, restorative side to God became flesh. And there is, there, is, there is a distinction all the way through the Bible, and don't ask me to understand it. I've read people who think they understand it, and I don't agree with any of them. Not because I've got a better idea, it's just I think it's so much bigger than we can truly co comprehend. God is Father, and God is Word, and God is Spirit, and God, the Word, became flesh. It's not that we as humans become God. It's that God, as God, became human. Again, that's big, and it sets us apart from any other religion or any other sect that's broken away from Christianity because neither Islam nor um, Mormonism nor Jehovah's Witnesses nor anyone else accepts that God could become flesh. Flesh is seen as corrupt. God can't take on corruption. Because flesh dies, it must be corrupt. Therefore, God couldn't become flesh. And how could God die on a cross? But the word did. Inextricably linked with the Father. God tasted death in Jesus for us, in order that we, in Jesus, would not just taste, but live in resurrection. So as I say, if you go through John, there's some heavy duty, and Mark will do it all, heavy duty <laughs> subjects in there. 
But the, the core of what John is saying, right from the beginning, from the offset, is the word who was alongside God, who was himself God, who was involved in creation and for whom everything was made, that word became a human. That word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory. Another theme of John is, is, is the glory. Now, nobody could see God and live. That was the deal. If you see God, you're just going to fry up. Because there's something not quite right in us. And he is utterly holy. And nobody could look on God. So even Moses was allowed to see the glory of God pass by. He was allowed to look at it in reverse. Or that's what glory looked like. But nobody could look on God and live. And yet, in Jesus, the word became human, dwelt amongst us, and his disciples were able to see his glory and live. They got an insight into what some of that looked like on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was, something of the glory that was his by right uh, came upon him, and Moses and Elijah uh, w met with him. They'd been dead a little while, by the way. Um, but not, that's the whole point. <laughs> they were with God. And Jesus met with them, and Peter, James, and John saw his glory, at least some of it, and lived to tell the tale. And so in John's other stuff that he writes, like Revelation, for instance, other stuff, uh, we, we find that, that heaven is, is the, the doors of heaven or the gates of heaven are opened up and the glory of Jesus is actually seen. And they see jo Stephen, my namesake, or am I his namesake, uh, Stephen, in the moment of laying down his life for the gospel uh, early in, in Acts, he saw heaven opened and he saw the glory of Jesus. And in Revelation, John also sees that vision of the word, also called the, oh, incidentally, in, Mark, in John, you'll come across the Lamb of God quite soon. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John pointed at Jesus, John the Baptist, a different John, points at Jesus and says, behold, have a good look, feast your eyes on that, on him, because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God's lamb. You see, the Jewish people would bring their lamb to be sacrificed um, as, as a, a sin offering. God provided his own lamb, which was himself, which was the word that became flesh. And again, it's a nice easy one, so Mark will unpack that. But he is the lamb of God. He is God's lamb. No other lamb can take sin away. Only God's lamb which was utterly perfect in every way. And then right at the end, you, you, you read in Revelation, there on the throne of heaven is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's his last mention. It doesn't get mentioned as a lion anymore. And they looked and saw a lamb looking like it had been slain. And it is the lamb of God that was invited to sit on God's throne and be worshipped. We, we sang this morning, one of the songs is quite clearly taken from that vision in Revelation of all of creation worshipping the Lamb. Because in worshipping the Lamb, they were honouring the Father. Because that Lamb is God's Lamb, into whose hands he's given everything and everyone and all of creation. And those who will receive from him eternal life. Summary, sort of. Next slide. So the, the purpose of, of this book that John wrote and the series that you'll be looking at is these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The purpose that you might believe and the outcome that you will have life. I want to finish on the next slide. Uh, with just, these are the challenges that I felt. The challenge, uh, and I've, I've, I feel many challenges, but as I was preparing these, this talk, these are the challenges that I felt again. The challenge of the invitation of John's Gospel. We live by faith in the Son of God. 
We to live as children of the king. We're not to live anymore as if this life and, the, and what people see and the stuff around us is what we're living for. No, we're not living for this. We're living as children of the king. Born into his family, kids. You know, we look at our royal family. I, have, I had a lot of respect for the queen. I have a growing respect for, for Charles, um, our king. Uh, I, I was able to hear him speak in Bethlehem uh, a few years ago when I was living in Israel. He visited Bethlehem. And I was quite struck by the fact that he has a clear Christian faith. It's not something that he expresses very often. I thought the king's speech had an element of that this year. But when he was meeting with the, the, the Palestinian leaders of the churches there in, in, in Bethlehem, he said this, or something like this. This is not word for word. He said, I pray for you every day. Every day you are in my personal prayers. Yeah, wow. So I do have respect for our royal family because of who they are individually, some of them, <laughs> and for, for the title that they hold. But we have an infinitely greater king and you know, you know that the tabloids have exposed various sins of the royal family, and it, disper it bespurches the name, doesn't it? Members of our royal family have not always behaved like you would want royalty to behave, have they? And it bespurches the whole thing. Now imagine what we do when we sin. This is the challenge I felt. You know, we should not be shy to say, God is my father, he's... he's given me new birth into a living hope. And therefore, I have a responsibility to uphold the family name. And I don't have to do it on my own. The Spirit of God comes and dwells in me in order to make those changes that are necessary that I wouldn't besmirch the family name. That's heavy. That's a heavy responsibility that comes with an awesome privilege. And when we sin, we go back to God and we dare to call him Father and say, Father, forgive me. I did know what I was doing. Or I didn't mean to do or say or think that. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me more like my older brother. Make me more like the king. Make me more like Father. Give me a spirit. So as you, again, read through John, there's loads of stuff about the empowering Holy Spirit. John's full of it, the empowering Holy Spirit, who enabled Jesus, the Word of God, who laid aside all of his glory and power in order to become human. The Holy Spirit then empowered him to be fully human. And the same Spirit that lived in Jesus, and the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is now also, Paul says, in us. In order that we might, before we even die, might be raised to new life. It's why, I've shared this with you before, three months ago or something, it's why I still have that, that strong conviction that it is the Father's will that Jesus should be walking the streets of Walton before he comes back. Before he comes back, Jesus wants to reveal himself in the flesh, in Walton and the surrounding area. How does he do that? Why is that a realistic expectation? Because we are the body of Christ. And this area needs to see what Jesus looks like through his church. That is big. This is not just religion. This is not just a belief structure or ticking the boxes of doctrine. This is about the Holy Spirit empowering people to be like Jesus in order that the light again might be seen and people might say, I get it. I knew what he was like before and I can see what he's like now. I get it. It's big. And we await his return, not as passive waiters. Well, I'm just going to sit back and wait for his return. And watch daytime TV. <laughs> and fantasize about it, having a home in the sun. <laughs> Which I would love to have at this time of year. I've got to be honest with you. But we, we don't just sit back into 
this life and wait for the king to return. But motivated by the fact that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we hasten his return by doing his stuff. There are verses that suggest that what's holding, some of what's holding the Father from sending Jesus back is he's waiting for us to do the stuff. It's not the whole story, but it's part of the story. So we don't just wait passively, but full of the Holy Spirit, putting sin behind us, putting on forgiveness when we fall short, living under the Father's name, embracing the fact that he embraces us, calls us his children. We actively wait for his return, doing the king's stuff. I think that's, is that the last one? That's good. You'll be pleased to know that's the last slide. And all God's people said, Amen. well, possibly, thank goodness. <laughs> Father, we do pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might mirror Jesus, that Jesus might be proud before the Father of saying, these are my people, this is my bride, my church, for whom I died. Lord, forgive us when we get it wrong, and help us to get it quickly. and receive the forgiveness that you freely give. We bless you and thank you, Lord, that you are the Word. You became flesh. You and the Father are one. Everything is yours. We can't give you anything you haven't got, but what we can do is give you what is yours. We pray by your Spirit you would enable us to do it in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.